grace and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us open with a word of prayer. Good and gracious God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. Palm Sunday has to be the most confusing day in our church year. Don't you think? Because we start outside and we're so excited and we wave palm branches and we say, God help us. Christ be with us. Save us. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. It's both a statement of deep faith, and it's also a cry for help, and it's also a joyful celebration of anticipatory hope. And then, we continue on in the service, and we hear the passion story. And we wonder how we could move in the course of an hour from Hosanna in the highest shouting with joy and hope to crucify him. Crucify him. And we're left at the end of service. Not as joyful as we started, which is usually the opposite of how I try to do worship. I don't know about you. But today is the day that the agenda is to leave you unsettled. Hopefully wanting more because you're unsettled. Today is the day for us to sit in the tension, for us to feel not quite right, for us to feel a bit confused and maybe even emotionally drained. That's the beginning of Holy Week. Unless we think that this makes no sense, let's imagine what the crowds felt when they were walking with Jesus. In the course of history, a week is about like an hour. And so in that week that is about like an hour, those crowds, they met Jesus and they saw in him the promised king, the one who they believed was the Messiah that had come in the name of the Lord, the son of David, whom they'd been waiting for. They got that right, didn't they? What they got wrong was what that meant and who Jesus was in the world. You see, they were expecting a king much like the one that we are always looking for. One who will come and decimate the enemy and build new foundations and kick out the Romans, whoever the Romans are in our day and age, and bring peace through violent victory. But there's a reason why Jesus comes on a donkey. There's a reason why, at the same time that Pilate punches Pilate, the Roman governor, is coming into town from the west side, full of statues of gold and clinking armor of soldiers and tromping horses, loud military noises, and yet, a very silent, fear-filled crowd. There's a reason why, at the moment of his procession, Jesus comes in from the east with a totally different procession, on a donkey and, in Matthew, on a colt. No fancy gold, no clinking armor, barely any hoof sounds, a real quiet procession except for the hope in the people and the shouts of the The problem is, he doesn't come to kick the Romans out through violent victory. And that is what confuses the crowds. When they start to realize that, they start to get confused. And you can see why people who are threatened by him 
would be able to convince them to shout out the words, crucify him, crucify him. Because you see, the Romans noticed this procession. They stood up, the Romans and the other Jewish leaders that were in boots with them, they stood up and they say, this man is a threat. And maybe they even perceived that he was a threat in ways far more powerful than military might. That he had the whole people behind him. Who knows what he could do? And so they convinced the people to change their shouts of Hosanna to cries of crucify him. We began Holy Week, I think, with very similar feelings. How many of us have spent the last several months being really confused? Maybe a little bit fear-filled about the future. How many of us have looked around in our nation and at our world and wondered what is going on in the world and seen leaders coming into power who are using power to hoard it for themselves, who are using power to dictate who gets medical care and who doesn't, to dictate who gets in and who doesn't, who needs to fear for their life and who doesn't. To convince all of us that there is not enough room for everyone. Some of us look at that and say, yes, we're on the right track. Some of us look at that and say, no, this is wrong. Most of us don't know how to respond. And so we're left confused. And we try to stay together as community, regardless of our different perspectives. We try to be open and to listen to each other and to try to figure out solutions together, but often we feel powerless in the midst of what seems like insurmountable power. If we're honest, I think we understand to a certain degree, to a certain degree, what the people, the crowds of Jesus' day were feeling. Confused, frightened, and emotionally strung out, not knowing how to act. And God's response to this confusion is to set before us not a military king, but a savior, a helper, who comes on a dime, who comes to bring us together united in love, who asks who we pledge our allegiance to. This is not a statement against the Pledge of Allegiance, by the way. That was just the phrase that I was using to say that the question of, that Jesus asks us is, where does your allegiance lie? And what does that mean for how we live in the world? Jesus' allegiance lied with God. And during the season of Lent, we have been hearing stories of Jesus revealing who he is to people in the world. And the stories that we've heard is Jesus revealing who he is to Nicodemus, the Pharisee, whom Jesus calls forward and says, yes, come. But then he talks about light and darkness about what it, that he is the light in the darkness. And for Nicodemus to come out of the darkness and to enter into the light in him. Stay tuned for Nicodemus' story at Resurrection. And then we meet the Samaritan woman at the well with Jesus. An outsider, a foreigner, a woman, Property at best. One to whom children ought to be born and then for the sake of the man, but really property. And not only any woman, but a woman who's had husband after husband, whether it's because of tragic circumstances or her own negligence in some matter. This woman was the epitome of one who should have been ostracized 
who is pushed to the edges of society, and yet Jesus meets her, a foreigner, and a woman, and says, Let me give you living water that wells up with you from within you like a spring and gushes out into your community, and then you be the one. You go and you be the one who witnesses to me. You foreigner woman, you witness to me. That is who I choose to use as my witness. And then we go a little further and to Lent, and we hear the story of the man who was born blind, how Jesus meets him, and, and everybody walks by him, and maybe they throw a few coins his way, but they're certainly not going to look him in the eye. We're familiar with that story. Not going to look him in the eye, not really going to talk to him, just going to throw money at him and, and pretend like we did our duty there. But Jesus looks at him, touches his eyes with mud, and says, I know that you can contribute to the world. And so I'm going to invite you to contribute to your own healing. Get up and walk. Elicit the community to help you get from one end of town to the opposite end of town, to the pool of Siloam, wash, and then see what happens. And out of trust for me in Jesus, the man does so, receives his sight, and becomes a witness to Jesus being the Messiah and the Son of God, and becomes his disciple. And then last week we heard the story of Lazarus. Talk about someone who was beyond hope. Lazarus was dead, and according to Jewish custom, after four days his soul left his body. And so he was that is a doornail, as they say. But death cannot hold back the power of God. And so Jesus says, Lazarus, come out. Jesus weeps with them, calls him out, and says to the crowd around them, Unbind this man. Free him, because freedom in God is what God wishes for all of us. You see, when Jesus rides on the donkey, he's asking us who we put our trust in and where our allegiance lies. Does our allegiance and our trust lie in the leaders of the world who might call us to harm our neighbor or to ignore the needs of our neighbor? Or to, to not talk in love to talk in spite and fear against people who disagree with us. Is that where our allegiance lies? Or does our allegiance lie with Christ? The one who loves those considered least in society. If you are considered least in society, God loves you. That is the message of Christ. I just don't see personally how, how we can see it any other way. I'm open to hearing your feedback. I want to hear what you have to say about that. Let's wrestle with these questions together, because I don't have all the answers. But this Holy Week calls us to struggle with the question of where does our allegiance lie, and what does that mean for how we live in the world, and how we relate to those in the world. Those who are considered least in society, those who we might be wanting to push away, and those who are considered great in society, and those who are in power, like Nicodemus. How does Christ respond to all of them? And if our allegiance is with Christ, we all have to answer that for ourselves. <coughs> then what does that mean for how we live in the world? When we cry out, God help us, let us know, beyond a shadow of a doubt, that God asks us to participate in that saving grace. And when our allegiance lies with Jesus, we can have hope and shout Hosanna not because he comes in violence to force our hand to be a certain way, 
but because he comes in love. And love is so deep that when we push him away and push him right onto the cross, and when we shout crucify him, he can also say to us, we forgive you. I forgive you. Come into new life with me. Because that's the beginning of the story. Not the end. Stay tuned for that. And so, people of God, let us shout again. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest.